the final man on the program. You know, when Orrin Lee Staley stepped down in January of this past year, he left an organization intact. He left a nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system in operation with computerized backup units. An organization that was built from nothing to where it had the ability to move production across this nation. The man that stepped into his position, although we had an organization put together, he had a tremendous, almost unbeatable task to perform. He had to gain the confidence of the membership who really didn't know how he would perform under stress conditions. He had to gain the credibility and the confidence of the industry who didn't know how this new president of the National Farmers Organization would perform. He had to gain the credibility and confidence of the political arena. He had to gain the credibility and confidence of the financial world. He had to scale down a staff that was at that time too large to handle this organization because of the financial conditions. He had to scale that staff down, but at the same time he had to keep a well-trained, highly qualified team of men and women together as a staff to continue the performance. He had to embark on a program of growth following that. It wasn't a small task. It was almost an unbeatable odds type, type of a task to have to overcome. But I'm proud to say that Devon Woodman, in stepping into the position of national president back in January, was able to achieve the task that laid before him. He was able to gain the credibility of the membership, the industry, the political arena, the financial world. He was able to scale down a staff and keep the, highly, the best and most highly qualified part of that staff, develop a team of high morale. And he'd done it in a very few short months. I'm proud to know this man. I'm proud to work with him. He's easy to work with. He understands people. He knows how to deal with it. So at this time, I want to introduce to you farmer and rancher from Idaho, Devon Woodland, the national president of the National Farmers Organization. Devon. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for those kind words. I've never felt prouder to be a part of a group of people than I do the group of people assembled here tonight. And sitting there in the audience, I see many of those who have been a major influence in this organization. And I take my hat off to them as they sit with us, as we discuss some of the very major issues that will affect this organization and this country. The film suggested, as you watched it tonight, that there is no organization that has a more complete program to offer the farmer and the rancher. And I submit to you there is no structure in this country or in the world equal to that which we have as members of this organization. The collection point structure, the dairy reload, the grain accumulation points are unequaled anywhere in the world. I think we only have really one topic to talk about tonight, 
and everything else becomes secondary. And that subject is, who is going to own the farmland in this country? Everything else we say and do becomes secondary to that issue. And I know, as many of you, that we have labored over the years in an attempt to gain, gain favor of those people that we associate with in various circles of society. And I know and recall there's times when you and I would like to invite a county agent to sit with us in a county meeting and hope that he would say something favorable about the National Farmers Organization. I submit to you today that those who assemble with us, we're happy to have them. And the recognition that this organization has received over the years, and that future that we talked about coming someday, that future is now here. I know that many of the things that I have had the opportunity to participate in are the fruits of labors of those who labored many, many years prior. And it just happened that I was the one that happened to be here as the president of this organization. And it wasn't anything that Devon Woodland done. It was the things that this organization had done and gained recognition for that we were invited to become a part of and involved in in this country. And I know that the solution is not there in that arena. And all that we do and attain will be done by we ourselves as farmers and ranchers. We will decide in our minds that we are ready. And when enough of us decide the time has come, then we will move forward. And there is no problem on my farm or yours that a price would not solve. And that price will come following the volume. We don't have any problem negotiating contracts with the industry for the supply we have. They want the supply and we have it. And I submit to you, as they have told us, that they will pay whatever we have to have when they have to. And there is enough volume on the outside of the perimeter of this organization that they can fill their needs without having to pay that cost of production that we feel so strongly about. Now, I don't want to take you on a travel log in any sense of the word, but I do think there are things that's happened that I would be very selfish if I didn't share with you. And so I'm going to take you back several months and bring you forward in hope of building pride in what you and I have. I received a call shortly after the change in leadership in the organization. I know that it was politically motivated. You have to understand those things and why they were made. But I received a call from our senator at home, who happened to be chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a very powerful committee, that reviews the treaties and trade arrangements with any foreign country. And he asked that this organization, he didn't ask that Devon Woodland go, but he asked that the National Farmers Organization be represented in that trade mission for one reason. And that was that, as he said, we know that you truly represent the farmer. Now, people. I think that's a tremendous compliment. He didn't have to say that, but he said that because he knew that you and I, the leadership 
the board of directors, the membership, are actively involved in tilling the soil. And as we made that trip abroad to China, I wasn't overly optimistic about what would happen, but I knew that I would be rubbing shoulders with the corporate presidents in the major companies in this country for two solid weeks. And I would have the opportunity to sit with them and discuss agriculture issues. And without exception, as I sat with those in the corporate field, representing many of the major corporations in this country, without exception, as I explained to them our program, as they asked, what are you all about? What are you trying to do? And they would repeat, if we can ever help you, give us a call. The major networks in the country was there with us, machinery implement dealers, Well, as we made that trip and met with those people in that country, remembering now that they represent 25% of the world population on basically a land mass equal to this, the need is great for agriculture goods in that country. Their ability to pay is extremely limited. And as I visited one of the premiers, I asked the question, do you believe that your society is going to change rapidly, or do you feel that it will be a slow developing change? He said, we believe in the student exchange program. We have 200 students abroad now. My next question was, will they stay when they return? And if you have followed the news media, you know that the Chinese people have had an uprising, demonstrations. They're at the Democratic wall with their posters and personal opinions. They want more involvement in government. They're going to demand that they become a more a part of the society which they saw when they were students. The major problem facing that country is feeding their people. They're not anxious to improve the diet of that country until they have the technology to do it themselves. And as we talked about possibility of trade, and we went to the right people, we had the ability to open the doors that we could not have done without the representation on that trade mission. Javits, Zerinsky, Bidel, members of that committee. And I explained to them without doubt that business that we had with them would be on American soil. But our experience had taught us that once you get on an ocean-going vessel, your ability to control the quality, your ability to deliver quality product to the buyer was extremely limited. And we were not interested in taking that risk. They seemed to understand. Well, the good that comes from such a mission is questionable at the time, but I am convinced it led to other contacts in this country that will provide benefits to you and I. A short time after that, we got an invitation to go into the White House and sit down there in the cabinet room and be briefed and discuss SALT II, a very hot issue at that time, still is. But the prestige of the organization has reached a pinnacle that we have hoped for for years. It wasn't long after that that we received another call, and I was extremely cautious about this invitation because I was fearful of being criticized by the membership for going abroad again. This was another trade mission that we went to Africa. This trade mission was made up of 
private businessmen in this country with an effort to establish trade relations abroad and, if possible, negotiate contracts on that visit that we could follow up. And the African people continually said, the Americans come through, they stop and talk, but we never hear from them again. We have reestablished contact with six out of the eight countries since returning from that visit. We have sent them price lists. We have sent to them the quality, the types that we have to offer. I'm convinced that if business is done in that country, it will be done with a third party, that the black country and community there will deal with the black community in this country. And so we have established contact with a man in New York who is a part in partnership with Arthur Ashe, the tennis player. And that gentleman is there now. He had called about a week ago wanting to know if we had X type of quality of product that possibly could be moved into the African community. Again, I made it very clear that business negotiations would take place on American soil with American dollar. And they understood and were willing to operate and negotiate on that premise. These things have such far-reaching effects and the ripples that go out that you find yourself with a, a, an image, a prestige that now puts you in the business community in the country. Just last week, a week ago Monday, we received a call from the White House and the president asked if we would like to come on a personal visit, bringing members of the national board and enter into discussions with him on agriculture. Nine of us went. We had represented in that group as we sat there with the president. We had dairy, grain, and meat. I didn't know for sure what the questions were going to be, and. I thought I knew how the discussion would evolve and how it would proceed. And as the president came in, he rounded the table shaking hands with each. And the thing that he remembered as we contacted was the trade mission and the briefing that he and I had, the debriefing that he and I had had the day following that trip return. As he visited with each of the board members, we surrounded the cabinet table and he led into a discussion. The discussion that he followed was strictly agriculture. I was looking for other questions and perhaps other entries into the discussion. He stayed strictly on agriculture. And after he had had his five minute introduction into the subject matter, he said, now I'd like to hear what you think. And for the next 25 minutes, he sat and listened. And I explained to him what our genuine concern was. And that is transfer of ownership of the soil from this generation of farmers to the next. I explained to him what made America great and special and different. It was ownership. Every industry in America has lost private ownership, with the exception of agriculture. And I said, Mr. President, we see that slipping. And out came his notebook, and he started taking notes. And his eyebrow raised. And then I said, I don't want to speak for the other gentlemen here. I want them to speak their own mind. And around that table pursued the discussion. I was never prouder. 
to be a part of a group than it was that board. We knew that we could probably only make about two points. And more than that, they would get lost in the shuffle. And they reiterated their concern. And then to put it all into a capsule, I said, Mr. President, I think that what we need to do is to restructure agriculture. We're involved in agriculture programs that were initiated 40 years ago. We have patched, we have put Band-Aids on them, there's holes in them. We have people slipping in underneath the cover, taking advantage of that unintentional hole. And I'm asking that you invite this organization to be a part of that discussion body when the agriculture policies in this country are reevaluated and restructured. <laughs> and then the real danger lies as you restructure this industry and its programs. And I know the programs are just an assist people, but they're a necessity until you and I get our house in order and operate our business as such. But the danger in restructuring a program such as we're talking about is that the wrong people are put on the program for the restructuring progress and that they forget the private ownership concept that made this country great. The president pursued as we finished our discussion with him and he had some very constructive things to say and I cautioned the fellows, let's not go in there and cry the blues. There are some good spots in agriculture. Let's talk about those and then let's talk about what we think needs to be done to change the programs that are not serving the interest of the farmer. The president said, you know, you and your organization can help us. He said, I remember when I was in Corning, Iowa, in your home office, and I reminded him just a few days before that his son was there. His son was in my office, and we visited for perhaps 15 or 20 minutes, and the board happened to be in session at the time that he was there. And I said, Chip, I think it would be wise if you went over and met the members of the board. And he went over into the boardroom, and I had each of the board members stand and introduce themselves and the states that they were from. And if they had some genuine concerns about trends in agriculture, they expressed their opinion. And as we went through that room and covered virtually every geographic area in America, I'm sure the phone rang in a matter of hours to Dad and said, hey, do you realize that that organization represents every agriculture geographic area in the United States? And he reminded us as we visited that he could recall being in our office. And he said, your organization can help us. We're in an energy crisis. We know that. And we're wondering if the farmers are being as energy conscious as they could be. We just listened. I anticipated that he would ask a question about the 50 cents tax on gas versus a coupon rationing. And I was ready to recommend the coupon rationing, but he never asked, so I never got to recommend. But he said, you know, the automotive industry has been put under scrutiny and have been given deadlines to bring the miles per gallon of the auto up to 27 miles per gallon as an average by, I don't recall the date, but sometime in the early 80s. He said, we have not at this point put any regulations or restrictions on agriculture that would suggest that they too need to conserve. 
He said, as you talk to your people, remind them that they too have a responsibility. We need to have more minimum tillage. And I've seen some minimum tillage programs and projects that has looked as good as any open plowed field that I have ever seen. And then he suggested perhaps that we consider a little more solar drying. Well, those are things that he was thinking and we didn't pursue an argument with him. But perhaps there's some validity in some of those issues. And then he turned to walk out the door and he went clear to the door and turned around and came back in took the floor for just another minute, and he said, you know, there will never again be a trade mission go from this country unless there is a farmer involved in that trade mission. <laughs> We're concerned. Those projections and predictions that you and I have been hearing that food is for people and not for profit, the farmers of this country have chosen by choice to be tillers of the soil for all of us. Inflation must be stopped even if it means the farmers sell his goods below cost of production. The family farm is gone and will never return, those things concern us. Interest rates at an all-time high, projecting to go higher, net farm income projected for 1980 to decrease 20 percent, expenses projected to increase 30. If those things are allowed to become realities, they will have closed the door on young people becoming involved in this industry as owner-operators. They do not have to happen. They do not have to happen if the farmers and ranchers will decide in their minds that it's not going to happen. Today, someone decided the price of hogs, cattle, grain, all farm commodities, the price was decided on them by someone today. Why ought it not to be decided by those of us who till the soil and are the manufacturers, if you will, of those goods? I sat an interview just yesterday with a gentleman and he said, you know, you tell me these things are happening or about to happen, happen and that the farmer has had some bad years and is still having some bad years. He said, my wife goes to the store and she comes back and she says, I can't afford to go again. Something's happening. What is it? And I says, the first thing you got to realize is that my wife goes to the store too. And then after she goes to the store and returns, I go out and I become a major consumer of goods in this country. I am the major consumer of steel, real estate. I provide the home, the car, the clothing all the things that the average consumer consumes, and then I move into major consumer items. And when people talk about consumer costs, I understand more so than anybody else in the country. What we have to do, people, is decide what we want. Decide in your mind, in fact, what you want. And as I ask people what they want, then I ask a follow-up question. Do you want your cost of production plus a profit, or do you want all you can get? 
We have had cost of production three times on various commodities in the last two years, and we haven't been wise enough to tie it down with contracts and forward contracts, and it slipped away. Do we want cost of production for our commodities, or we do we want all we can get? I'll tell you what I want. I want to have the ability to pass on my input costs that I have no control over, just like everybody else in this society does. When those who are in the schoolroom, the classroom teaching, if they have an increased cost in their car payment, if they have an increased cost in interest, they go to the bargaining table and there they negotiate a contract and they pass that cost on. If labor is experiencing or is exposed to an increased cost in food items, in clothing, in any commodity which they consume, they go to the bargaining table and they pass that on. I want to have the same right as everybody else in this society has, and that is to pass on my consumer costs that I have no control over. There is no way that I can roll back interest costs. There is no way that I can roll back the cost of petroleum, which shortly is going to increase by midsummer. They become a fixed cost that increases my overhead, and I must deal with them. Now, we have a choice to make, and that choice is one that we're going to have to make whether we choose so or not. We have no alternative. We must make that choice, and that is as these costs escalate and become a part of our farming operations, we absorb them by increasing our debt load, or we design a way to pass them on to others. We have no third choice. And that farm debt load that we experience now is the highest ever in the history of the industry. And we can only absorb that debt so long as inflated land values will allow us to increase the mortgage. And when we reach that point of absorption, we have no other alternative. If you have not designed a way to pass those costs on, you become a part of the migration from rural America. Now, what we have to do is decide what we want and then discipline ourselves to accept that which we have asked for. I can't discipline you. I can suggest, but I know that once you decide what you want for what you have to sell, that you must discipline yourself to accept that and protect your future. And if you haven't got the ability to discipline yourself to that extent, then greed will set in and it will destroy your markets time and time again and you'll operate on the fluctuation of the market that we talked about with the Board of Trade. All right, maybe I'm talking to some who may feel as though the problem isn't real. Let me take and deal for just a moment. The need has to be there. All projections that we receive and become exposed to suggest to us the need is there. The individual farmer and rancher becomes totally unimportant. The survival of you and I as individuals is not a genuine concern of anyone but ourselves, our wives, our family. But collectively, we become an extremely important segment. And so we have to decide now whether, in fact, there's a need. 
whether in fact we can survive the system as it's now structured individually, or whether we need the association of each other and because of numbers we become a very strong, powerful force. And there are those who shun when you talk about the power that can be generated by an organization such as this when they reach total success. It doesn't worry me. There's nothing wrong with power. It's the misuse or the non-use of power that's dangerous. This is a powerful country we have. And this country has the responsibility to protect the interests of people and exercise that power in so doing. And so the power that is properly used, that I'm convinced will be properly used by the farmers and ranchers of this country, I'm not afraid of. The power that I would be reluctant to accept is the power that we see used by other corporate structures in this country when it comes to the profit margins, comes to the point of using people. And I would hesitate to think what would happen if that same type of power were exercised over such an industry of importance as that which you and I have now in the palms of our hands. So we decide whether the need is there. And then we structure a plan to reach the goal that we establish for ourselves out there in the future. We have established such a plan. Part of it was shown to you here tonight. That plan was instituted many years ago when we started to design the nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system. That system, when it moves in concert, in unison, can become the most powerful structure in this country. No company has the ability to move that many facilities together. And even though you may feel somewhat remote and feel that your little part may not count, when you put that little part together with several other hundred like it, you become a very powerful force in causing market reaction. And so we designed the plan. We have explained it to you. It hasn't always worked as we would like to have had it done. And as we became involved in the trial and error methods, many times we were embarrassed because the things that we thought would happen didn't happen that way. But at least we were big enough and our shoulders were broad enough that we accepted the responsibility for that and we were willing to move on. And as then we take a look at that goal that this plan is going to move us toward, that goal was to someday establish our right to price. And we haven't reached that yet. It's out there in the future. But we're moving toward that goal. We have set goals for a year. We have set them for 18 months. We have set them for two years, three years, four years, and five years. And we have gone over these goals with the departments, and they have been assigned and have readily accepted the percent of increase that it would take to reach the goals that we're going to be talking about now. We're moving through the organization and have been for some time between $650 million and $750 million worth of commodity. And that's no small task. And that's a far cry from the dollar day and the $25 day year dues that you were exposed to years ago. The organization's time has come and we're maturing and moving into programs that now become the type that appeal to the intellect versus the emotional approach that we use for so many, many years. The goals that we have established and the departments have accepted that by June 1981, 18 months down the road, we will be moving $1.5 billion worth of commodity through this organization.
how are they coming? The percent that would cause this to happen, they're pretty well on course. They may vary just a little bit, but they're on course, and we check weekly with them. How's your goals, your percentages, are they holding? And five years from today, the projections that we're now looking at will be $5 billion of commodity through this organization. And people, when that happens, this organization will be the source of agriculture markets. The challenge is there. It's going to take total commitment of people. I don't know how many of you here tonight are using the marketing structure of the organization. But I know this, that if every one of you here tonight was using the marketing structure, the bargaining programs, the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system in this organization, we would be moving $1.5 billion next week. And so we will take and we will work with you and help you become involved in the programs and we will plead with you and spend the time necessary to restore and build confidence in the programs and that they can and will work. Yes, the job is no easier than it was a year or two ago. You know, the challenge comes in a person's lifetime, and many times the success or failure of that challenge depends on you as an individual. But the challenge that we're faced with now in this organization the success of that challenge depends on all of us as to whether we succeed or fail. I want to talk to you a little bit about some things that might be, and I don't want to be accused of rambling tonight, but I have so many things I want to touch on, and I'm going to do it, and hopefully you will understand and follow with me. The attorneys that are handling the lawsuit for the organization here in Kansas City. The lead counsel in that suit is here. He gave one report to the convention, and that was in the Resolutions Committee. And I asked him if he would like to give a convention report to the delegates, and he wanted to the worst way. But his better judgment dictated to him that it would be unwise. Here at the back door of the judge who's hearing and trying the case and having had acceptance and success in it to this point, we both decided it would be foolish to take any chance and risk. But I can talk to you just a little bit about it as a layman and not get in any trouble. And that is now we've been involved in this suit for seven years. Seems like a lifetime, a long time, and only you and I know what this organization has been through. And it was all because we had to prove our innocence to charges that were made against us. That's what brought it on. We could admit guilt or fight and prove our innocence. And we were innocent and we chose to prove, and let me submit to you today, but the briefs have been filed. The final briefs have been completed. And we are more innocent today than we thought. <laughs> you never know the outcome of those cases. They're in the hands of the judge. When he disposes of them as it has his leisure, we fully anticipate that it will be during the year 1980. If he readily involves himself in it, 
It could be as early as four months. But we fully anticipate it to happen during the year 1980. Of course, it can be appealed. Well, the costs now are minimized, and the waiting process would be the painful thing. And just exactly what will be the outcome, I don't know. I'm optimistic. I'm confident. As we thumb through and read the briefs, every board member will have a copy of those briefs that he can study. And the decisions made on that case, if any type of settlement is reached before the judge issues his verdict, will be made by your national board of directors. Well, those are some of the things.